The next topic in module five is something called the average rate of change. And that's where you have a function or an equation that is changing and you want to see how it is changing. Let me just, I think the easiest thing to do is just to do an example. And in a minute, I'm going to show you some information from the textbook. But let me describe the problem. It's sort of like a story problem. This comes out of like biology or science. There's this kind of a, I think it may be like a bacteria. It's called E. coli. And in a lab or in a hospital, what happens is this E. coli grows over time. In other words, if you observe it and try and measure it, it grows as the time passes. And what I'm going to show you in a minute are some data where they look at, matter of fact, maybe I'll just copy it here. The amount of time that's passed, we'll call it T, and it's measured in hours, versus the amount of E. coli, they're going to call this variable P, and it's measured in grams. It's like a weight. So the information from the lab is at zero time, when it first starts out, there's 0 0.09 grams of E. coli. And then as they observe it, they come back and they wait two and a half hours and they measure. And then after two and a half hours, the E. coli has grown from 0.09 to 0.18. They come back and measure at three and a half hours. And now it's at 0 0.26, so you can see it continues to grow. Then they measured it at 4.5 hours and it was 0 0.35. So I and then at six hours to final measurement, 0 0.5. Now the average rate of change, what you do is you look at two separate points. And you basically are trying to measure how much have things changed per the amount of time that has passed. So in this case, we're going to look at how much the E. coli has changed, how much the weight of the E. coli has changed based upon the change in time. So in the book, here's the first question they ask. They say find the average rate of change in the E. coli from 0 to 2.5 hours. So the starting point is when the time was 0 and then they want to see how things have changed after two and a half hours. So here's the average rate of change 
it's final minus initial E. coli over divided by the amount of time that has passed. So for this one, if I'm looking from 0 to 2.5, so it's this right here and 2.5 is this right here, the final at 2.5 hours, I'm measuring 0 0.18 grams of E. coli, and I subtract what it was initially, 0 0.09 grams of E. coli, so this is really how much it's changed. That's what I have here. The change in the E. coli. And you calculate change by taking the final amount. You subtract the initial amount. And the amount of time from 0 to 2.5 hours is obviously 2.5 hours. And when you do the math, which I've already done, it's 0 0.036 grams per hour. So that tells you how much the amount of E. coli is changing with respect to time. And then just for fun, they had you do another one. They said, how about from 5.6 hours to 6 hours. What's the average rate of change from 4.5 to 6 hours? So it's the same idea. I'm looking at the amount of E. coli at the final point, which is 6 hours, which is 0 0.5. Initially, here I'm looking at the window from 4.5 hours to 6 hours, or 4.5 hours, the amount of E. coli was 0 0.35. Now the amount of time that's passed, well, how much time has passed from 4.5 hours to 6 hours? 1.5 hours. And now if you do this calculation, you get 0 0.1 gram per hour. So it's interesting how the first calculation was 0 0.036 and this is 0.1. Looks like it's growing faster. So it looks like maybe the more that time passes, the faster this grows. All right, so that's how to calculate average rate of change. So in module five, you're gonna have a couple problems that deal with this kind of situation, so not too difficult. Now the next topic, we've been talking about functions, and actually, if we look at graphs of functions, typically, maybe you have something like this. Maybe if we have a linear function, it's a straight line. Maybe if we have a quadratic function, it's like a parabola. The one thing that's true about all three of these, we like to say that these are continuous functions. This is something, if you ever take calculus, you're going to talk about again. One quick way to check to see if you have a continuous function on a graph can I take my pen or marker and can I trace out the whole graph without ever lifting my pen off the page? If I can, then we say we have a continuous graph. It continues all the time. There's no gaps or breaks. Matter of fact, all three of these are continuous. But what would happen if we have something like this, it 
Say we go to here, for some reason, we have like a break or a gap, and it drops down to here, and then goes like this. This would not be continuous. If I tried to trace out this graph, I go up to here, but then if I wanted to keep tracing the graph, I have to lift my pen off the page and go to here. So it's not continuous. As a matter of fact, we give a name to this kind of a function, or this situation. We like to call this a piecewise function. It's almost like the function has separate pieces. Like here's the first piece. And then here's the second piece. It's almost like two pieces. It's almost like two separate graphs, but it's actually on the same graph. That's what a piecewise function is. Now this is a graph, but we also have piecewise functions expressed as an equation. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go ahead and write down a piecewise function as an equation. And after I do that, based upon that piecewise function equation, then we're going to create the graph. So, here's how you write a piecewise function. In this case, there are going to be three parts to it. I draw this bracket here. The first part, it's f of x equals 2x plus 2. But you're going to see there's a condition for this function. <clears throat> and what it says, f of x equals this function if x is less than or equal to negative 1. Now, there's going to be a second function, f of x equals x squared, and this is applied if x is greater than negative, greater than negative 1 and less than 1. So you can see the first function only applies when x is less than negative 1. So if you think about a number line, here's negative 1. So any value of x in here, it's this first function. But then from negative 1 to 1, if I have any value of x between negative 1 and 1, I go apply the second function. And then the final function says f of x equals 2 if x is greater than or equal to 1. So the third part is greater than 1, and that's going to be the third function. And before I graph this, it's just for fun. See if we understand what's going on here. What if I say what does f of 5 equal? f of 5 says go find the value of the function when x is equal to 5. So what you have to do, you have to go up here because there's three different functions and each of these functions are based upon the value of x. I have to go figure out which function I'm talking about. And in this case, if x is 5, it looks like it's going to be this third function because this is the function you use if x is greater than or equal to 1. 
in this case, it's just a constant. So f of 5 would equal 2. What if we said, what is f of negative 5? Once again, you first have to figure out which piece of the function applies here, and then we can look at the function. So when x is negative 5, it looks like this first function, first part of the function, applies if x is less than or equal to negative 1. Negative 5 is less than negative 1. So therefore, it's going to be 2x plus 2. So 2, and in place of x, I put the minus 5 plus 2. Negative 10 plus 2. Looks like it's negative 8. What if I say, what is f of 0? So now I'm looking to calculate the value of this function when x equals 0. So first thing is I can figure out where or which, which piece of the function applies. And it looks like when x is 0, this middle function is when x is greater than negative 1 or less than 1. So it's going to be in here. So it's x squared, and since x is 0, it's just 0 squared, which is 0. Let's do a couple more. How about I say what is f of negative 1? Now when I go look, actually I see negative 1 two different places x less than or equal to negative 1, then x greater than negative 1. However, the inequality signs are important because this one, when it says x is less than or equal to negative 1, that includes negative 1. Where down here, x is greater than negative 1 does not include negative 1. So I'm going to use the first function, which is 2x plus 2, so 2 times minus 1 plus 2 minus 2 plus 2 looks like it equals 0. And we could do more, but hopefully you sort of get the idea. The first step is you look at the value of x they've given you, decide which function applies, and then once you know which function applies, go ahead and apply the equation. Now for fun, let's go ahead and try and graph this function. Hopefully we'll have room on here to see it. call this x and y. y, of course, is the same as f of x. So it's almost like i got to break up my graph into three sections. The first one, x less or equal to negative 1. So it's almost like I'm going to put a very faint, just to help me. This is going to be where the first function is. And the second function is between negative 1 and 1. So the second function applies in here, and the third function is going to apply out over here. So it's a little tricky, but let's try to apply this. So the first function is over here, 2x plus 2. This, I know, is going to be a straight line. It's linear. So if I can just find two points over here in region 1, then I can draw my graph. So let's just, if I plug in negative 3, What would f of negative 3 be? It would be 2 times negative 3, negative 6, plus 2, negative 4, right? So negative 3 and then 
let's see what f of negative 2. So if I plug in negative 2 here, it's going to be negative 4 plus 2. Negative 2. Now you notice this is less than or equal to negative 1. So when I get to my negative 1, I should just see what is negative 1. Oh, this definitely is not going to be... Oh, yeah. Um, yep, it's going to be 0. And you notice here, I put a filled-in circle, which means... this graph includes this point, which is true because it says this function applies when x is equal to negative 1. Now the second part is this from negative 1 to 1, and it's x squared. So when I put in negative 1, it's just going to be 1. So when x is negative 1, and you notice here I'm going to put an empty circle here because it actually... When x is negative 1, I cannot include the point. Now, if I put in x equals 0, you get 0. Now, if I go to my other boundary, when x is 1, you get 1 again. But once again, I can't include it. Hopefully, you see why I'm putting these empty circles, because x has to be between negative 1 and 1. It can't actually be negative 1 and 1. And this ends up being like a parabola. And then finally, the last function, which is pretty simple, f of x equals 2. That's just going to be a horizontal straight line at y equals 2. And now, because it includes the 1 here, I'm going to put a filled-in circle. So there's the graph of this piecewise function. It's almost like three separate graphs all sort of squished together on the same graph. All right. So I think we'll have one more video now on transformations, and then we'll be done with Module 5.